morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the third webinar of GHIT PDP's webinar series. Session three is TB Alliance, titled Putting Partnerships to Work for Better Pasta TB Cures. We are pleased to have you from all over the world. I am Eriko Koyama of GHIT Fund, and I will be the moderator of this webinar today. This webinar is sponsored by many organizations, the Japan Alliance on Global NTDs, JAG NTD, Japan Association of Clinical Reagents Industries, Japan Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, JPMA, Japanese Association for Infectious Diseases, Japanese Society of Parasitology, Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine, and Japanese Society of Vaccinology. And here is the overview of today's session, featuring TB Alliance, a PDP focusing on fight against the tuberculosis. Then, please allow me to give you some guidance about the webinar before we start. Today's session will be conducted in English, but we also have a simultaneous translation to Japanese available. If you wish to listen to the webinar in Japanese, Please choose Japanese from the interpretation box on your right hand corner. Also, please feel, please feel free to send your questions anytime during the webinar via the Q&A box at the bottom of this window. We also accept questions in Japanese. We also accept questions to be addressed verbally during this Q&A session, and we will give you the instructions during this Q&A session. If you have any technical issues, please contact the email address indicated here. Please kindly note that we will be recording today's webinar and we are planning to upload it on GHIT websites after this webinar. There will be also a questionnaire at the end of this webinar, so it would be great if you could take two minutes of your time to answer them. We have started this webinar series to maintain the momentum and foster dialogue about the R&D community's role, challenges, and opportunities in the fight against neglected diseases during, the, during and post-COVID-19 pandemic era. In our last session with DNDI, we discussed the importance of partnership in the development of the treatment for the most neglected diseases. In this session three, with TB Alliance, we will focus on the achievements and challenges for the fight against tuberculosis. Now, I would like to introduce the panelists of today's webinar. Today's panelists will be Dr. Takushi Kaneko of TB Alliance, Dr. Ishin Tanaka of Daichi Sankyo RD Novare, and Professor Scott Franzblau of University of Illinois at Chicago. We would like to start this first presentation with uh, Dr. Takushi Kaneko of TB Alliance. Kaneko-sensei, if you could unmute yourself and start sharing your screen, that would be very great. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. You can see. OK, great. Um, so I feel very uh, privileged to be able to um, participate in this uh, webinar series. And uh, um, my the focus on, in my presentation are twofold. One is to tell you about our organization, TB Alliance, what it's about. And second uh, goal is to um, tell you about the collaboration and the GHIT funding with the Japanese uh, research organizations and the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. So um, let's see, I should go to... Uh, let's see. 
Okay. So for last two, two years, almost to the day, we've been um, combating um, the pandemic. And, and uh, um, I'm talking about COVID-19, of course, uh, caused by the uh, SARS uh, uh, coronavirus. And this primarily affects the uh, respiratory system and the other organs as well. And it's an airborne disease. And just recently, it was announced that uh, more than 5 million people uh, died from this uh, disease. And it is also speculated that it's a gross uh, underestimation of the actual number of people who succumb to this uh, disease. But there is also another pandemic, and that is the uh, tuberculosis. And this is caused by a bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it is, um, it's affected mainly the respiratory organs, but also other organs can be infected by the bacteria. And it's an uh, airborne disease. And it's responsible for uh, uh, more than 1.5 million uh, deaths in the uh, last year. And uh, it, is, it has been uh, with us since the beginning of uh, uh, mankind. So I think it's been with, uh, with us for such a long time. And the, um, just to give you a little more background on TB, uh, every year uh, more than uh, 1 million children become ill with TB and 1.5 to 1.4 to 1.5 million people die from TB. And the, uh, there are uh, 10 million new TB cases every year. And for the uh, people who are infected with HIV or AIDS, the, um, the, this is a leading uh, killer of, of the uh, people. Um, and unfortunately, drug resistance is on the rise uh, and about half million uh, cases uh, every, every year. And you may wonder why, if it's such a uh, pandemic, why we are in the state we are now. And the answer might be uh, uh, found in the next slide. Uh, this is the timeline of the um, of, of of the drug development against TB, and. Um, before before 1940s, uh, if you have a TB, uh, you are sent to a sanatorium if you are lucky enough, uh, and then you are told to uh, breathe clean air and um, um, the rest and so on. But obviously, it was not a very effective um, uh, therapy. In 1943, uh, streptomycin was um, the, uh, discovered by uh, Professor Waxman at the Rutgers University. And this uh, marked the beginning of the uh, antibiotic uh, therapy uh, against TB. And then in the following uh, years, the paraminosalicylic acid, isoniazid, pirazinamide, um, uh, calamycin, and so on, and, and rifampicin were uh, discovered. Uh, in, in 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s. And essentially, there, there were no new drugs introduced um, until uh, very recently uh, in, in, this, in this period here, and I'll talk about that uh, later. But um, in 19, middle of 1980s, uh, there was a um, new regimen, uh, so-called short therapy, which consists of uh, isoniazid, uh, rifampicin, pirazinamide, and uh, etambutol was developed by many by uh, British um, scientists. And even though this is called short therapy, uh, it still takes uh, six a month and, and for drug sensitive uh, patients. Um, and, and the, uh, in the, um, Industrialized countries, the uh, TB was somewhat controlled, but in the rest of the world, 
uh, it was quite rampant and many, uh, many people uh, suffered from this disease. So early, early two, year 2000, uh, there was a um, uh, Cape Town uh, meeting and uh, a Cape Town declaration was uh, issued to accelerate the development of new drugs uh, to shorten the treatment of TB and to facilitate uh, its control in the poorest countries. And uh, uh, signatories included Rockefeller Foundation, United States, NIH, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a Welcome Trust, uh, Doctors Without uh, Borders, and so on. And this uh, became uh, uh, or provided a roadmap for establishing a uh, global uh, alliance for TB drug uh, development, which is also uh, called TB Alliance. And uh, TB Alliance, uh, uh, we are a product development partnership organization, and we rely heavily on the um, collaboration and academic collaborations with uh, academic laboratories and the pharmaceutical industry to maximize the speed and efficiency of the drug discovery uh, and development. In other, words, in other words, there is not much economical incentive uh, for uh, pharmaceutical companies to be involved in this area. And whatever the uh, fund we can use, we have to uh, make it to go uh, uh, farthest possible. And that's why we need uh, very close collaborations. Um, and the, uh, TBL, at the TBLNs, we cover the essential whole uh, range of drug, drug discovery and development areas. So target selection up to clinical trials and uh, registration and so on. And uh, currently we have about 60 employees and uh, uh, we have office in New York City as well as uh, um, Pretoria, uh, South Africa. Um, and as a, a part of the um, accomplishment uh, we have, uh, I would like to tell you about the uh, story of uh, uh, Pretomanid, which is also called PA24. PA24 uh, has this structure, a relatively simple structure, but it's a new chemotype for as, as a TB drug. And also it's a new mechanism of action. And this compound was uh, initially licensed from uh, pathogenesis. And then um, we developed this compound um, and it showed potent in vitro and in vivo activity. Uh, MIC of about 0.2 or so microgram per milliliter. And uh, uh, studies carried out at the Johns Hopkins University by Professor Eric uh, Nuremberger showed the promising uh, synergistic effect, especially when it's combined with uh, bedaquilin and uh, uh, linezolid. So bedaquilin is an ATP synthase uh, inhibitor in my mycobacterium tuberculosis, and the linezolid, as you may may know the protein synthesis inhibitor as a general antibiotic. And uh, because of this combination, we call it uh, uh, BPAL uh, regimen. And in a clinical trial, um, a phase three clinical trial called uh, NIX-TB, we tested this uh, three drug combination, pretomanid, Belaquidin and uh, Rinazolid uh, for uh, extensively drug resistant uh, patients and also multi drug resistant uh, TB uh, participant. And we treated them um, six to uh, nine months and then we followed them up uh, for two, two, two years uh, to make sure there is no recurrence of the disease. And um, Historically, this group of patients are very difficult to treat. It usually takes uh, 18 months or uh, longer to two years and so on. And also uh, it requires uh, a lot of different kinds of 
uh, drugs, uh, some of them have rather uh, severe uh, side effects and so on. So um, this, the outcome of this experiment the experiment or clinical trial is shown in the next slide. Um, we had uh, 109 um, patients altogether, and 71 of them had the XDR-TB, and 38 of them had uh, MDR-TB. And the uh, patient who had a favorable outcome was 89% of them uh, from the uh, first group and 92% of them from the second group. So overall, about 90% uh, of uh, uh, patients had a favorable um, outcome. And this is, it's a little difficult to compare with historical uh, numbers, but the before the Belaquilin was uh, introduced to, to the, the field, the cure rate of uh, this group of people is about 30%. So uh, I think uh, this is a, a um, significant achievement in terms of uh, um, bringing out a, a favorable, favorable result uh, for after treatment. And um, and this can be so we and this was approved uh, by FDA in uh, 2019 for this uh, this group of uh, patients and the um, the difference between uh, more historical uh, treatment and the this uh, the BPL treatment can be seen in this uh, picture so in a BPL patient, this is a number of pills you have to take a day, whereas in the more um, historical um, treatment, uh, this is the number of medicine you have to take a day. So it simplified the uh, treatment as well as it shortened the um, treatment uh, period. And also this is all oral and uh, uh, six months uh, treatment. Um, and we are still trying to improve the process, not the process, but the regimen uh, by uh, including additional uh, uh, drugs and so on. But this one just shows you like how long it's take, it took us to, uh, uh, to develop this, uh, make the combination or regimen. So we, we um, licensed this, uh, PA24 in 2004, and then 2019, it was approved, approved by FDA, and subsequently, it was approved also by European uh, medicine, um, the, uh, the uh, EMA uh, group. Uh, so going to the next day, uh, slide, this is uh, where we are now. We we have uh, we it takes about four plus months to cure a uh, TB patient, and eventually we'd like to get down to less than three months, and uh, furthermore we'd like to get down to uh, seven to ten days. Um, the this, uh, the reason we call universal uh, regimen is that uh, eventually if we have all new drugs in the, in the, in the mixture, in the regimen, uh, we, do not have, we do not have any uh, possibility of re drug resistance. So we do, not, we do not have to distinguish drug resistant patients from the uh, drug sensitive resistance. So that's why it's, uh, we call uh, to, it, it, we think it's possible to have a universal regimen. Um, so this isn't the, for the future, but this future is not here yet. Um, and we need as many drug hits and drug uh, leads as possible because of the attrition rates as it goes from one stage to the next stage in the drug, drug development. But also in the quality, because uh, mechanic uh, mechanism action and the targets are quite important 
uh, to avoid uh, drug resistance and to achieve the uh, 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 treatment shortening. So um, this is where we are. Um, but there is also um, in, uh, quite significant uh, changes in our approach for drug discovery or to identify hits and leads. And uh, uh, some of these are listed, some of these are listed here. So historically or traditionally, uh, it was more an empirical approach we uh, carry out high throughput screening against the mycobacterium tuberculosis or some surrogate organism. And then, then we uh, find out what the mechanism of action is and then use that information to design new uh, analogs and so on. Whereas now we are more technology uh, based or more hypothesis based approach. So one of the uh, new approaches is the, what we call uh, CRISPR in interference technology. And this is uh, pursued or uh, promoted by uh, Professor um, 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 Jeremy Rock of uh, Rockefeller University and Doug Schnappinger at the Cornell Medical School. And this helps us to identify which gene products uh, as a, a target might be uh, most uh, um, desirable for intervention uh, by a small molecule. So um, this is, I think this is going to be a very useful uh, technology. The other uh, area is the metabolomics of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this was, this is uh, being uh, pursued by uh, Professor Curie at the University of uh, Cornell Medical Center. And this follows the fate of um, compound. Once, once it's in uh, uh, my inside of mycobacterium bacteria itself, or the uh, it follows the changes in the metabolism of the bacteria itself. And again, I think it's going to be a quite useful uh, process. And the um, the third. Um, innovation uh, or the uh, some um, information useful for, for drug discovery is this uh, more uh, um, focus on the casein. Uh, casein is the necrotic uh, um, area inside the, the granuloma. And the um, as many of you, you know that the mycobacterium um, tuberculosis uh, intracellular pathogen. So it's get inside of uh, macrophage and it stays there. Um, but then it forms this kind of granuloma and, and inside in the center of granuloma is the uh, so, uh, what they call cheese-like uh, substance. And there are some uh, mycobacteria uh, 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 they are in 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 this in in this area, but this area is uh, not close to the blood supply and not very high. Uh, does not have very high oxygen and so on. So it's very difficult to treat the bacteria in that kind of uh, area. And 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 so I think this is a very interesting approach. And the, uh, this is uh, pursued uh, mainly by Veronique uh, Datua. Uh, and, and and this picture here is another uh, um, pic the picture stained picture of granuloma. It's, also, it's hard to see, but this is the periphery of granuloma. But inside here, if you can uh, strain your eyes, there there are still yellow or golden spots uh, scattered all around. And essentially, we have to. Get, to, uh, get rid of uh, those uh, bacteria in, in this region to uh, cure the patient. And the other uh, uh, approach is since MTB uh, reside in macrophages, we have to find an agent that can get into macrophage and kill macrophage. 
and uh, some of the agent can kill um, MTB uh, more specifically when it's in uh, macrophage. And this approach is uh, being uh, pursued by uh, uh, Professor uh, Deb, uh, Rus Russell at the Cornell University in upstate uh, New York. And the, um, there, there are more uh, sort of mathematical or computational approach to figure out uh, which drug combination is the best for uh, drug treatment. So uh, even though I forgot to mention that almost all the therapy is uh, uh, drug combination um, therapy because as people found out with streptomycin, if you just use a single agent, the pathogen becomes very uh, resist, uh, develops resistance very quickly. So to decrease that kind of possibility, we use a mixture of compounds, two or three or five or four or five uh, that drug uh, combinations. So uh, these are the more uh, theory-based approach and uh, it, hopefully it can shorten the time to find the best uh, drug combinations. And the, um, there are some artificial intelligence approach and also host-directed uh, therapeutic approaches. So uh, the, this is important uh, as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And, and uh, um, so uh, let me see just, oh, it's okay. Um, so, so the establishment of uh, GHIT fund in 2013 was very uh, transformative uh, and innovative uh, event uh, because um, until then, uh, there was no um, easy way for Japanese or any anybody, international researchers to contribute to, um, to the uh, global health. And um, this, this organization was set up and then uh, it's, uh, made, it's provided a conduit uh, for the uh, researchers to contribute to uh, global health. And uh, TB Alliance has uh, um, collaborated with uh, GHIT Fund since its inception, and it's enabled us to, um, to uh, um, work closely or, uh, with Japanese pharmaceutical uh, or, or organization and also uh, and the uh, um, um, the research organizations and and the uh, we 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 were able to uh, uh, test a lot many uh, compounds and learn the diverse approaches to uh, the the drug development and some of the uh, collaborators are shown here and at present we have uh, four. Um, hit to lead uh, stage project uh, ongoing with Asteras and Chugai and uh, Daichi Sankyo and uh, Takeda. And uh, uh, since we're run I'm running out a little time, I'll just skip this page. But in this particular seminar, I would like to emphasize the importance of natural product chemistry. And Japan has a very rich history of natural product uh, development and discovery. And I already mentioned the calamycin and amycacin. And also uh, everybody knows Professor Omura's contribution in natural product and uh, mitomycin and so on. So um, our, our co-presenter is going to talk about more specifics of the our collaboration. And this just shows the donors to TV Alliance and uh, we, I gratefully acknowledge the uh, leadership and uh, uh, contribution by the GHIT group. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Kaneko Sensei, for your very detailed presentation about TB Alliance's history and achievements for the fight against tuberculosis. 
as well as some insights to the innovative approaches that you plan uh, that there is for the TB treatment. Thank you so much again, Kaneko Sensei. You're welcome. And um, to to all the audiences for today, thank you for joining us again. And please feel free to use the Q and A box to address any questions you may have throughout the webinar. Some of you, um, okay. So next, um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Ishin Tanaka of Dait Sankyo RD Novare. And uh, thank you, Tanaka. -san. And um, I think you're you're unmuted as well. Okay. So, okay, so please you very uh, much. start your presentation. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Yeah, I shared my slide. Please wait. Mm -hmm. Can you yes, see my slides? See yes, we can see your slides, thank you. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So I'll start. <sighs> I'm a scientist who belong to the Applied Microbiology Group, Biological Research Department at Dutch Sankyo Laurie Novare. I'll be giving a talk on our partnership with TB Alliance for anti-tuberculosis drug discovery from natural product. This is, this is a brief summary of my experience working on the discovery of drug from natural product. I joined Sankyo Company Limited in 1995 and worked there until 2007. Sankyo developed and commercialized the natural product derived probostogen as a cholesterol-lowering drug. After that, Sankyo became Diet Sankyo Company Limited due to the merger of the company and I became a researcher of this new company. In 2011, I became a researcher of newly established Dite Sankyo Lovely Novare Company Limited. Through, throughout this time, I have consistently engaged in research on the drug discovery from natural products. My initial task was curating the microorganism library. When I joined the Sankyo, I collected the bacidiomyces that formed the minute bacidio pulp here. My current task is both finding the effective use of microorganism library or microbial extract libraries and developing new technology for drug discovery from natural products. Dite Sankyo Laurie Novare was established in 2011 with the mission of playing a role in a global R&D function of Dite Sankyo Group by building an advanced technological foundation and support innovative drug discovery and high quality clinical development process. Our business consists of three units, drug discovery research unit, transformational research unit, and clinical development unit. I belong to the drug discovery research unit. Here is the microorganism library of Dait Sankyo Lovely Novare, which is the basis of our research. It consists of fungi, actinomycetes, and bacteria. In terms of number of strains, fungi and actinomycetes have approximately the same number, while there are slightly fewer bacteria. In fungi, Discomycetes, basidiomycetes, and white are characteristic. And rare actinomycetes and marine bacteria are also characteristic. The library contains a large number of strains isolated from terrestrial and marine environment in Japan. The library is organized by molecular systematics based on RDNA. 
we utilize fermentation extract library derived from the microorganism library in our research. This library and research function were inherited by Dait Sankyo Ardinovare from Sankyo. I would like to introduce the origin of our collaboration with TB Alliance in 2014. TB Alliance planned to conduct anti-tuberculosis drug discovery research from natural product in Japan and had been surveying Japanese research institutes through the JHIT fund. Daichi Sankyo Ardi Noware was seeking a chance to expand the utilization of its microorganism library. We received an explanation about the significance of the collaboration from the JHIT fund. The explanation focused on the following points. Strong needs for a novelist microorganism library. Supported research costs by JHIT fund and the PDP. And expected contribution to the global health through our expertise in drug discovery research. Then the collaboration with TB Alliance started. This slide show our history of anti-tuberculosis drug discovery from natural product. Former company Sankyo performed drug discovery research. Since the 1980s, the company's research had been shifting to other area of unmet medical needs. Research was suspended over uh, for more, more than 30 years. While the anti-tuberculosis drug discovery research was suspended, the technology advanced. Such advances included molecular phytogenetics, including uh, increased understanding of microbial genome and development of synthetic biology. Screening project study in 2015 the main difference from the screening 30 years ago are the use of expanded and more diverse microorganism library organized by molecular systematics and the use of mycobacterium tuberculosis, not mycobacterium smegmatis for phenotype screening. This slide shows a status of GHIT fund sponsored project with TB Alliance. Two projects are ongoing. First project of screening started in 2015. At this screening stage, we are able to find novel compounds with an unknown mechanism of action. We applied for the G2RE project twice and were awarded funding in 2019. A new project study in 2021, based on the previous achievement. The new project aims at discovering novel compounds that act on a specific target. This slide shows the load in the screening project. Brown indicated the research material and blue indicated the research activity. Early Novare provided TB Alliance with the fermentation extract generated from the microorganism library. TB Alliance conduct phenotype screening. Research activity of TB Alliance are performed at the cross sector partners of TB Alliance in blue character here. R.D. Novari prepared the fractionated sample from the heat extract. TB Alliance conduct phenotype screening for the fractionated samples. R.D. Novari isolate and purify the active compounds from the active samples 
and elucidate its structure. Moreover, early novari perform refermentation to obtain the sufficient volume of the sample to meet the needs. TB Alliance evaluates the activity of the active compounds from the various, various perspectives. In addition, TB Alliance acquires in vitro admit data to evaluate the potential of the compound. Ultimately, we comprehensively consider the obtained data and proceed to apply to hit to read project for GHIT fund if the compounds meet the criteria at this stage. This slide shows the law of Daitsenke or early Novari in hit to read project. We make a deliberatization plan with TB Alliance and provide the parent or analog compounds used for deliberatization. At this stage, gram scale compounds are needed. In addition, analog compounds or basic skeleton of the compounds used for diversification of cellular synthesis are needed. To provide the compounds efficiently, we wanted to authorize genomic information and the biosynthetic genes of the producing microorganisms. This slide shows our perspective for the utilization of microbial genome. Recent advances in the research have facilitated the acquisition of microbial genome and the biosynthetic gene. The genomic information on the microorganisms is expected to be used in the research on drug discovery from natural products to have the amount of compounds needed for various evaluation and the development of derivatives. In our current project, we are working on the improving the productivity of natural product by utilizing the genomic information of the wild strain. In the future, we hope to be able to generate novel compounds This slide shows a summary of our partnership with TB Alliance for anti-tuberculosis drug discovery from natural product in GHIT fund sponsored project. Microorganism libraries are still an attractive source of new drug leads from which new active compounds can be found. With support from GHIT fund, this proven and limitless source can be put to great use for neglected diseases. A combination of know-how accumulated within our organization and the new approaches in the micro, microbial genome and the biosystem gene can generate novel reads. Finally, I would like to thank our project partners, Dicht Fan and TB Alliance. And I'm grateful that our project have continued and advanced to this point with the cooperation of many scientists, researchers, and members of different departments at the Sankyo Arudinovare. Among the cross sector partners of TB Alliance, I would especially like to thank Dr. Nori Odoi and Dr. Yasuhiro Horita of Japan Anti-Tuberculosis Association and Professor Scott G. Plantbrow of University of Illinois, Chicago. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tanaka-san, for your presentation about your work and findings on natural products, as well as about your collaboration with TB Alliance and about the potentials for the microorganism libraries. Thank you so much, Tanaka-san, again. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So to everyone again, 
Um, please feel free to use the Q&A box to address any questions you may have throughout this webinar. And next, I would like to in, uh, pass on to our next speaker. Um, please allow me to introduce Professor Scott Franzrau of University of Illinois at Chicago. So Professor Scott, uh, I think you're, yes, you're also unmuted. And yes, we can see your slides as well. Okay. Thank you very much. When I became the director of the Institute for TB Research at the University of Illinois, I decided that in addition to our own discovery, TB drug discovery efforts in-house um, in our institute, that we would make our resources available to help anybody in the world who was interested in joining the fight against TB. And probably our, uh, the, the group that we've interacted with the most um, since that time has been the, uh, the TB Alliance, uh, really since their inception um, in the year 2000. This slide shows where our institute resides. We're within the College of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois, and we're associated with the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. This allows us to collaborate with other researchers within the department, in particular um, with the natural products research group uh, that allows us to do um, a lot of in-house drug discovery projects for TB, where we can do uh, screening, isolation, and structure elucidation of natural products. But we also have access to researchers in the university's research resources center. And this allows us to also undertake target-based discovery or to move projects into um, target-based um, efforts. In particular, we can express molecular targets uh, in TB. We can uh, look at binding of compounds to them. We can do crystallization of the target and co-crystal structures of ligands with the target. So we, we have the ability to, uh, to support multiple approaches, but what I will speak about today is what is most commonly used in helping others outside our institute and in their TB drug discovery efforts, and that is our in vitro and in vivo bioassays. This slide lists what I consider to be the major challenges at the drug discovery stage for TB. That is that you're working with a dangerous organism and that it grows very slowly. To solve the first problem, uh, we rely upon very good biosafety equipment for our researchers and we work within a, a BSL-3 laboratory. Um, as Dr. Tanaka also alluded to, uh, we don't begin with mycobacterium surrogates, less virulent, but we use fully virulent M. tuberculosis. Um, but we do tend to use drug sensitive strains at the early stages of discovery. To overcome the problems of the slow growth of this bacteria, which can take up to three weeks or longer to form colonies, we use metabolic surrogates of viability. Um, a very common assay used with, with many organisms is rosagerin reduction. And we developed the original assay for this in microplate format for TB uh, many years ago. Uh, more recently, we make more use of luciferase reporter genes. So we put these genes into M tuberculosis and we can tell if it's alive or dead just by its production of luminescence. We have several other assays as well. For in vivo work to overcome, to partially overcome the slow growth of this bacteria, um, we've recently been examining a qPCR method that will reduce the total time for a mouse model, which is shown here, um, we can reduce that by three weeks by using this qPCR method. I'll mention this at the end. And then maybe most importantly here, um, as, uh, as Dr. Kaneko mentioned, a major goal is to reduce the total duration of treatment for TB. And we think the key to that is killing bacteria that are not actively growing. And so we developed a number of years ago an assay to specifically look at that property of compounds. Will it not only kill growing TB, will it kill non-growing TB efficiently?
Okay, so I won't show many slides uh, this detailed, but I did want to point out that these are two luciferase reporter constructs. The one on the left was one we originally used, where you had to add the substrate in order to see luminescence of the bacteria. And there's still one assay with mice where we actually still use this. But this type of reporter where the plasmid encodes both the enzyme and the substrate means that the bacteria into which this is inserted will now be luminescent all of the time as long as it is viable and in, in, um, in a state where it can generate a certain amount of energy to produce luminescence. So this has become a very uh, key piece of technology in helping us to develop assays for M. tuberculosis that are much shorter than the, than the older classical methods. So in one example of that is here. So this is the beginning of a, of a common drug discovery scheme, one where we might be doing high throughput screening against some tuberculosis. And using this reporter strain of TB, we can incubate samples for one week and determine if they're living or dead. Um, that's actually fast for tuberculosis. And we can do up to 100,000 samples per month if they are supplied in 384 well plates. So in a case where a company has a large library of natural product extracts or of pure compounds, um, this is something that allows us to screen maybe the entire library in a reasonable period of time. Compounds that show reduced luminescence then go on to the next stage, which is really to determine the MIC. And here we usually switch to a different assay so that we end up with two different readouts and we have more confidence that this assay truly reflects viability. At the same time, we'll look at activity against a mammalian cell line, and we tend to use Vero cells. These are green monkey kidney cells. And we look at the ratio here of what it takes to kill TB versus mammalian cell. And compounds that have a minimum selectivity index of 10, of course, we'd like it to be higher, but a minimum of 10, we would consider a hit compound and a compound that could then go into in vitro profiling to see if it has other favorable properties. So what might some of those properties be? Okay, shown here are a number of different properties um, that would be valuable in a TB drug, but maybe not all of them are essential. Potential to shorten treatment, as we talked about, um, is a huge advantage. And so there I will describe this assay in, in detail. Actually, I'll describe a number of these in detail. Um, following. But this, you can read these. Um, these are obviously um, good properties to have. And these are the assays that we either have or have developed new versions of to determine whether they have these properties more quickly than in the past. Um, and also I want to mention here, because I won't discuss this further, is that we can also help to determine the, uh, the target and the mechanism of action of compounds if you don't already know that. Um, and we do this by very classical methods of generating resistant mutants and then determining um, whole, ge whole genome sequencing and looking for um, genes that are known to be essential, which, which carry mutations. And then we have other assays to help us determine, um, to confirm whether in fact that is truly the molecular target. So this is the assay that I was referring to where we can look at killing or the ability to kill M. tuberculosis, which is not actively growing. Again, these would be the persister bacteria, okay, that are responsible for the long treatment duration. So here we adapt M. tuberculosis to low oxygen. This is a, a, a somewhat lengthy process, but once they're adapted and they're carrying this gene, we can expose them to test compounds, um, flush out the atmosphere and replace it with a low oxygen environment. And that will allow TB not to grow but will, if the TB is adapted, will now survive the 10 days of low oxygen. At the end, we could determine whether the compounds have killed them by either plating onto solid media and waiting several weeks for colonies, or more rapidly, we could give them 28 hours to breathe. We, give, we put them back in normal oxygen levels. And if they are still alive, they will be able to produce luminescent signal. This is why we call it a recovery assay, the ability to recover the ability to make this luminescent signal. And this has really been a, a major um, advantage. There are other groups that do these types of assays in different ways. Um, 
but we've had really pretty good success. And, uh, and we've been able to validate this assay uh, with compounds that are then shown to uh, reduce treatment times in mice um, and in one or two cases in, in humans. So we can also use the same Lux ABCD strain to determine killing more rapidly. Um, and this just shows it schematically. And what I just wanna point out is that this really, again, reduces the time. If we do classical MBCs, it can take us more than a month to complete the experiment. Whereas luminescence, we can actually get this result in uh, somewhere between seven and 14 days. And this shows, again, that we can now look at time kill because we can read luminescence at any point in time. And this shows you two interesting compounds. These are both cyclic peptides that hit the same target. Um, and the one on the top actually has the better MIC, but actually takes a longer time to kill than the compound on the bottom where the MIC is a little bit higher, maybe threefold higher, but actually kills very rapidly and is actually a more bactericidal compound. So again, we can start to profile compounds and learn more about them other than do they just inhibit TB. Um, Post-antibiotic effect is another uh, assay that we can use for profiling. This is not absolutely essential if the compound has very good PK properties, but where it doesn't, it's a valuable assay um, to profile a compound with. We give it a short exposure, maybe two hours, then we dilute 1,000 to 10,000 fold, far beyond the MIC. And then we ask how much longer does it take to grow up one log from where we began compared to untreated controls? And that time interval would be defined as the post-antibiotic effect. So this shows rifampin having a fairly good one, um, our cyclic peptides as well. And isoniazid actually does not have a great antibiotic effect, but it really doesn't need it because it actually has good PK properties. So again, this is a property that's nice to have, not always essential. Uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Kaneko mentioned um, the macrophage assay and showed you that picture of the granuloma. And this is how we determine activity against uh, macrophages infected with TB. And we treat them, we add an additional treatment overnight with amicacin that kills any of the bacteria that did not make it into the macrophage that were not phagocytosed. Um, and then we incubate for up to a week or a little longer. And again, now with the luminescence, we could look at the viability over time, in this case, three days, five days, seven days, and see a very nice dose response in the case of amicacin, which does not kill bacteria that are inside the macrophage, we see a very weak response. I'm sorry, um, some trouble advancing. Okay, and then we have to further the profiling, we look at the activity against a number of different bacteria. The first one's being drug resistant strains of TB. We use a panel, each resistant to a single drug. This allows us to work more safely with TB, but gives us essentially the same information as we would get against an MDR strain, although we can test those later at other laboratories. We also look at global clade representatives of TB collected from around the world. These are, are the major genetic clades. We also look at activity against other mycobacteria. So the compound may have added activity. This might also give us a hint between looking at other mycobacteria and looking at common gram positives and gram negatives as to where the target may be or may not be, it more or less helps us to exclude. Um, but the last property is one where we hope that we do not see a lot of uh, strong activity because we prefer that compounds have narrow spectrum against mycobacteria. Okay, and this is obviously to, um, to decrease the inhibition of normal, normal flora. And then when we move into mouse models, we, in our lab, we run two, an acute infection model and a chronic infection. In both of these, we can infect batches of about 100 mice in this aerosol infection chamber. And then at about day 10, they are all contained within lung granulomas and they begin to grow. And they will grow up to between 1 million and 10 million bacteria per mouse. And then the immune system will limit them from there on. And we can treat during this time while the TB is actively growing, and here you can see an active compound. We can also let them reach the chronic phase, and after which they just 
act as a plateau. They don't increase further. We can look at killing over a period of time. Usually this will be at least four weeks of treatment, um, possibly six or eight weeks. And then as I mentioned in the first slide, we can also reduce the total time here, which obviously is very long, by about three weeks by not having to wait for colonies when we take the lung homogenates. But we can also do qPCR by using a specific dye that will penetrate only dead cells and block PCR, thereby allowing us only to quantitate the number of living bacteria. And here you can see a nice correlation between CFU and the PCR in a dose response. And finally, uh, my last slide will show you what we believe to be, or this would be my somewhat my opinion and somewhat a consensus opinion as to what would constitute an ideal drug lead. This is not a drug candidate at this point, but just the lead and what we would consider acceptable. And if I jump to the bottom, what we would define as a lead would be any compound that shows activity in mice. We would say at least a one log reduction. So anything here that would eventually lead to a one log reduction. And obviously this is a function of both the anti-TB activity and the pharmacokinetics, which is not something that we typically do for the TB Alliance in our laboratory, but we do have that capability. And this just shows you know, ideal, actually these, this column here would probably also be um, a very good uh, candidate profile for a drug, um, certainly ideal for a lead compound. Some of these are more important than others. Activity against intracellular TB is important because eventually the TB is intracellular in those mouse models that we showed. Some are less critical. They don't, we don't have to have them, but they would actually be very valuable. Um, so I would give you, you know, just a minute or so to view this, and I'm already out of time. And uh, but this does conclude my talk. Um, I hope I showed you that what we can do to help your group if you are interested in uh, joining the fight against TB. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Scott, for your very detailed presentation about the work on the fight against the TB, as well as the challenges you have in the TB drug discovery, and also some insights to the TB drug discovery, focusing on its phenotypic screening. Thank you so much again, Professor Scott. And please feel out to everyone, please feel to, free to use the Q&A box if you have any questions to the panelists throughout this webinar. And now uh, we would like to move on to the panel discussion. And I would like to invite um, all the panelists uh, again back to the room, as well as um, the Dr. Kay Katsuno from GHIT Fund um, to be part of the panelists uh, in this panel discussion. So thank you for rejoining us um, to all the panelists. And uh, please, uh, please allow me to give my first question. Uh, my first question will be for Professor Scott. And um, I would also then like to ask uh, Kaneko-sensei for any additional comments. And my first question will be, um, um, I think you have also uh, touched upon it uh, during your presentation as well, but we understand that the success rate for the IND of TB drugs are very low. What are the challenges specific to the TB drug development that, that you may have? I, well, I did mention uh, those about the, the virulence of the organism. Many people do not want to work with them tuberculosis, um, but certainly we have groups around the world today that do. Um, and, uh, and in Japan, you have Dr. Norio Doi, who was mentored in Dr. Tanaka's presentation, who's been doing this for a long time. Uh, time, I think, is a, is a major impediment because everything does take longer with, with TV, even though we have these shorter assays. Um, and I think also because the duration of treatment for TB is very long, although our goal is to shorten it, um, we, have, we really have more of a need for narrow spectrum drugs. Um, although many companies would like to develop broad spectrum, I think today in general, we do, we, do more, we do value more narrow spectrum drugs and for TB maybe even more so. 
I think another area is drug-drug uh, interactions. Because TB drugs will probably never be used alone for treating active tuberculosis, um, that we really have to ensure that we have an absolute minimum of drug-drug interactions. And also because you may also be treating TB HIV infected patients. Um, so I think these are also some of the, of the major challenges. And then certainly we, because it is a disease of uh, global health significance and affects so, many, affects so many people, we really want to have an all oral drug regimen. So um, to the extent possible. I think all of these are challenges that are maybe not completely specific to TE, but certainly um, if you add them all together, um, they create a major challenge for TB drug development. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Scott, for answering that and uh, explaining the difficulties uh, you have in the TB drug development. And maybe Kaliko Sensei, do you have um, anything to add to that? Um. Yes, just a, a couple more things, I think. Um, the uh, TB bacteria, they have very thick waxy cell wall and uh, for a drug molecule to penetrate into the, uh, the bacteria, inside the bacteria is, is uh, challenging. Um, and the um, other thing is that the niche, you know, special niche they have in in terms of animal models, um, again, uh, delivery of the drug to that uh, kind of situation is is is, is challenging as well. Um, and and as Scott mentioned, that for most of the patients, uh, I mean the the majority of the patients are in more developing countries. And as uh, uh, Scott mentioned, it has to be already uh, available, bioavailable, and also easily dispensed. So, uh, and then for stability and so on. So I, I think that's another uh, complicating uh, factors, factor, yeah. Thank you, Kaniko Sensei, for your additional comments. And, then I have the follow-on question to Kaneko Sensei again. Um, so you've also mentioned about this in your presentation already, but if you could maybe uh, pick up some of the um, new approaches um, or innovative ideas uh, you think is necessary to overcome the current challenges you have, and um, is there um, are there opportunities for the Japanese partners to be newly involved? in this TB drug discovery? Right, so I think it's a very good question. And uh, I, I, um, I, I mentioned some innovative um, ideas in one of my slides. Um, and and uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, so I think we are, we are realizing now that even if one drug uh, inhibit the, let's say, uh, RNA polymerase. And if, if you find another uh, drug which does the same thing, but the, the downstream effect seems to be different. So I, I think we have to realize there is a, some difference in terms of how the uh, compound interact with the target and, and you know what's eventual cause it, it, it makes. And, and so I, I think we are getting to that kind of more hypothesis based or uh, uh, theory based approaches now uh, rather than um, just testing a lot of compounds uh, phenotypically, which is still very useful. And I think maybe still the most, most widely used approach, but if we can incorporate some uh, additional science or technology into the, the process, I think that would be much more effective and it will be much better use of limited fund and limited time and limited uh, manpower. Thank you, Kaneko-sensei, uh, for answering that question. And um, 
maybe in terms of the um, interests uh, that we, we may have um, um, for the TB drug discovery from the Japanese partners, maybe um, uh, Katsuno-san, do we have anything that um, Jihid could comment about maybe a new partnership uh, formation or any potential for starting a new drug discovery or collaboration with our uh, panelists that we have today? Sure, uh, excuse me. Um, sure, Erica. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Professor Scott and uh, Dr. Kanako for your explanation. Um, regarding the difficulty of um, TB drug discovery and development, I think uh, you well captured you know, why it's so difficult in comparison to many other diseases. So thanks for that. Um, just wanted to quickly mention that um, the reasons that you have mentioned, um, these are exactly the reasons why we uh, we are in need of, you know, continuing our work in terms of, you know, new drug discovery efforts um, in this area. And, you know, some of the examples are, you know, the ones that have, um, that were explained by uh, Dr. Tanek, uh, uh, Tanaka and also Dr. Kaneko and Professor Scott in terms of a new discovery work uh, under the GHEAD funding scheme. So given the attrition rate, I think we still need to do many more uh, discovery work. Um, so... In, in fact, uh, looking back at the past history of GHEAD, we have funded uh, you know, as, uh, as many as 12 uh, new discovery work for TB specifically speaking. Um, and these uh, 12 partnerships uh, consist of many uh, Japanese counterparts uh, consisting of both pharmaceutical industry as well as academia, like research organizations and universities. So um, I think we definitely look forward to um, having continuous dialogue with many more researchers, um, such as the ones that are present today in, um, as the audience. So, and also as Dr. Kaneko mentioned earlier, um, in addition to traditional phenotypic screening system, uh, it's a good news that there are now many more new innovative um, ideas or approaches such as AI technology or uh, CRISPR interfer interference technology as uh, Takashi mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to comment on that point. Uh, back to you, Erica. Thank you, Katsuno-san, for your comments. And now I'd like to move on to my next question, which is uh, for Tanaka-san. And um, what is the biggest challenges or lessons learned um, to you after collaborating uh, with TB Alliance? Tanaka-san, yeah. if you could answer that question, that would be great. Thank you for your uh, question. Um, my colleague and I learned that TB Alliance at the PDPs are promoting drug discovery research for neglected diseases. We could actually get involved in the drug discovery research with TB Alliance to the GHIT fund. Previously, we had only known about the approaches to research and develop drugs within the company. My colleague and I recognize that there are many different approaches to conduct drug discovery research. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tanaka-san, for, for answering that. Thank you so much. It is uh, great to know that um, there are many potentials, um, or you have learned that there are many potentials by working with uh, TB Alliance or other PDPs. Thank you so much. My next question will be to Professor Scott. Um, so what is your experience uh, with the Japanese partners and what panelists, uh, what potentials do you see collaborating with Japanese researchers or Japanese pharmaceuticals? And what are the uniqueness of the Japanese uh, compound libraries? So my experience um, in working with Japanese partners began with my postdoctoral research um, at uh, Kurume Daigaku in uh, 1984 in uh, leprosy research, leprosy, Nihongo de Raibyo. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, then in uh, 1993, uh, we interacted with uh, Dai Nippon Seaku uh, mm -hmm. with their uh, drug uh, Sparfloxacin. Um, for we had uh, had tested this compound in mice and we were then involved in clinical trials in the Philippines. So we had a, uh, 
a close relationship um, mm -hmm. with that company, or I did. Um, and they actually traveled to the Philippines um, to see where we were conducting the trials. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1993, I had a, a short collaboration with Taisho Pharmaceuticals uh, with their Macrolide library, uh, where I was interested in looking at this for, uh, for tuberculosis. Uh, since that time, um, most of my interaction uh, with Japanese scientists is uh, with uh, Takushi-san. <laughs> um, and, uh, but really, you know, we were involved in all of those uh, GHIT funded um, collaborations with the companies that he showed, um, many of which involved uh, high throughput screens to begin with, and then moved on um, to profiling from there. And um, I, uh, regarding, uh, my otherwise my perspective on uh, on Japanese um, collaborators, I think any researcher who's interested in antibiotics knows that um, that the Japanese companies really and 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 institution researchers really led this effort from the beginning from natural products um, and and so really have a very deep expertise. So on the natural product side you know, is certainly the place where you would want to be collaborating. Um, and because I think, so as I assume, there's a long institutional memory um, in many of these institutions. The, the libraries themselves, obviously we've screened ones that are very large um, and, you know, yielded um, a good number of hits. But I, I don't know, you know, I can't know for proprietary reasons, you know, the nature um, of, of, especially of some of the compound libraries, um, but I would comment more on just the interaction because, you know, everyone we've worked with has been extremely organized and very flexible because you always run into difficulties downstream, you know, how much compounds available, when is it being sent and to work with groups that are highly organized as, as most Japanese are in my experience, um, is really a major advantage, um, especially for a group like ours, because we tend to have many collaborations going on at one time around the world. So this is always uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Professor Scott, for your comments mm -hmm. and, and also the advantages uh, working with the Japanese mm -hmm. partners and your experience working with the Japanese partners. And it is really nice to know that you were actually in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 for one year, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But I think that um, really helped uh, for your background to also be able to work with uh, collaborating with the Japanese partners. Yeah. Thank you so much again. Mm -hmm. And um, as the time is uh, running out, I'd like to make uh, my next question, my last question for the uh, panel discussion. And uh, that would be my final question will be for Tanaka-san again. And this, this may be a little bit uh, a difficult question. Yeah answer, but um, my question is, where do you see benefits at your personal level to be involved in the R&D of infectious diseases, given that the company focus is not on infectious diseases? If you could maybe um, give an answer to that question, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, historically, yeah, th there have been a very close relationship between research on drug discovery from natural product and drug discovery research for infectious diseases. However, you said uh, there are a few projects in the company for discovering drug discovery for infectious diseases. Against this background, my task is to find an effective use of microorganism library. Being involved in the GHIT fund sponsored project with TB Alliance have given me an uh, opportunity to utilize the microorganism library and pursue the full potential. Th that's a very good thing to me. That's all. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Tanaka-san, for answering that uh, very difficult question. Thank you so much again. And thank you to all the panelists again um, for participating in the panel discussion. 
So now I'd like to move on to the Q&A session, uh, which is the final part of this webinar. And uh, for this part, I'd like to pass on to my colleague, uh, Mr. Hironobu Itabashi uh, of GHIT Band to moderate this Q&A session. So, um, Dabasan, yes, thank you. Thank you for turning on your camera. So if you could unmute and start the Q&A session, that would be great. Thank you very much, um, Koyama-san, and for all the presenters and the participants as well for joining the call, the webinar today. So my name is Hironobu Itabashi, and I will be moderating the Q&A session. So first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for sending uh, so many questions to the Q&A box. And for this Q&A session, um, I would like to give you some brief instruction. So if you would like to ask your question uh, orally, uh, please use the raise hand um, on the bottom of the screen, and then we could um, see who raises the hand. And I will appoint you so that you could read your question or just simply use the Q&A box and send your questions. If you want to speak, um, please say your name and organization before your question. And it would, it would be great if you could only ask one question to allow other participants to ask their questions too. So let me first start and see if there are anyone who has raised uh, the hand. Otherwise, I'll move on to the questions that were sent on the Q&A box. So at this moment, I do not see any hand. So let me uh, move on to the Q&A uh, box questions. So the first one that we have received, let me read the question. So this one, we have received the question in Japanese. So I will read it, uh, do a quick translation in English. Right. So what kind of new test methods are required to validate the effectiveness of establishing new therapies? And this question is to Dr. Kaneko. Okay. Thank you very much for, the, for your question. I think it's a very uh, important question. Um, typically, we um, test our compounds in efficacy, mouse efficacy models. Um, and the, um, you would like to compare with the standard treatment, which is the mixture of, of four components, the rifampicin, uh, the um, isoninergy, the pirazinamine, uh, uh, maybe at least three components. And, and then you want to see uh, at least the equivalent or better um, efficacy in um, uh, mouse or animal models. And, um, and and also I think in the in, at the in vitro uh, stage, uh, you would like to test your compounds against the clinical isolates uh, from patients and hospitals and so on to make sure your compound uh, works uh, well uh, in a broad sense. Uh, I, so I think I think there are. Um, ways to compare your new treatment or your compound against the existing uh, compounds. Um, so, so mainly efficacy we're looking for, but also, you know, um, less side effect and so on as, as, as well. I hope that's answered the question, but I'm not sure. Uh, Scott, uh, do you have anything to add? Um, not really. Um, I, I agree with, um, with, with those points. I mean, really, you, you, you don't really know if you have something, yeah, um, of value until you see efficacy in a, in a mouse model. Mm -hmm. Um, and then increasingly in the more challenging mouse models, um, including one that I did not mention today. Um, but there is one that one model that more closely mimics the human disease mm -hmm. with respect to the different types of lesions. And that model is, it's, it's known as the Kramnik model, but that is even more challenging model than, than the ones that, that I showed today. Um, certainly yeah. 
um, if you could demonstrate activity in that kind of model, it probably gives you increased confidence. But I think with with uh, Takushi san mentioned um, to look at this and to do the the original tests usually I guess are like the substitution tests where you you take the existing TB drug regimen and you you um, substitute your new compound for one of the existing ones and see does it perform as well or or hopefully better. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaneko mm -hmm. and Professor Scott for your answers. So let me move on to the next question and I will check again if there anyone who has raised a hand. Okay, so I do not see anyone. So let me continue with the next uh, question. So it's a little bit long, but this question is again to Dr. Kaneko. So let me read the question. BPO provide XDR, MDR, TB patients with high possibility of survival from the disease. However, side effects by linezolid is challenged for completion of the treatment. Xenex will give us answer for proper dose. However, how do you think of a candidate drug to replace linezolid? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes. Uh, uh, it is it is a challenging question uh, because the this three dog co uh, combination um, you know it's it's quite efficacious but there are some um, adverse effects as well uh, and uh, we think it's mainly coming from uh, denazolid uh, it's it's the um, bone marrow toxicity and also uh, peripheral ne neuropathy. And and uh, we think these are due to the um, inhibition of protein synthesis in in the, in the mitochondria uh, protein synthesis inhibition. So uh, we are trying to develop a newer drug, uh, newer um, oxidorinone drug. So it's related to rinazolid, which has much less uh, reduced. Um, the safety liability in terms of uh, and 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 we are using a mitochondrial protein synthesis as an indicator, so that's that's at least one approach. Um, eventually, uh, would like to make it uh, you know um, make make it safer, not not necessarily safer, but it's less uh, having less side effects and. So that we 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 can uh, treat the drug um, sensitive uh, patients as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaneko, yeah. for your question. So we just saw uh, someone who raised the hand, um, but we do not see it. If that person could raise the hand again, so that we could identify and um, hear the question. Okay, um, sorry, it was for just for a moment and uh, we missed the, the name, but um, if none, uh, I think we could move on um, to the um, next question. Okay, let me just read the question, next question. And unfortunately, this will be the last question, so please um, make your uh, answers very short. And uh, this question is to Professor Scott. So the numerical value of long CFU reduction was presented as a standard for lead compounds and development candidate compounds, but it is not a standard that requires complete killing with a single component, and it is sufficient if it can be reduced to some extent. Would this be correct? Because cocktail therapy can be expected to have addictive and synergetic effects and can be complemented. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that I completely understood the, um, the question. Um, certainly, if, if, if I did understand it correctly, um, that we don't necessarily need to see, you know, impressive killing um, by CFU with a single compound um, because it may actually be more beneficial in combination. Um, mm -hmm. And if that was the question, 
That is true. And I think there's actually a good example. And maybe the best example is actually, um, I don't know if Dr. Kaneko would agree with me, maybe is linazolid. Um, it is not overly potent by itself um, in a mouse assay. It does show activity, um, but not not as you know as good activity as something like um, protominid or bedaquil and the other partners, but in combination, it seems to really synergize with or or really enhance um, the activity, uh, which is why they would why the TV Alliance is working just to find you know a safer version of that same compound. But yeah, I would agree. I, I agree with that um, with the uh, the questioner's um, supposition. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Scott, for your answer. And as much as we would like to continue with the Q&A session, we're unfortunately running out of time. So I will pass the mic to my colleague, uh, Kwema san Thank you, everyone, for the participating. Thank you. Thank you, Tabas san for taking the Q&A session. And also uh, to all the panelists answering all the questions received by the audiences. And we're sorry, we are a bit over time. Um, uh, but please allow me to give some final notes um, for this webinar. And thank you again to all of the panels, panelists for the great discussion today. And uh, Dr. Takushi Kaneko of TV Alliance, Dr. Ishin Tanaka of Daik Sankyo Adi Nobare, and Professor Scott Franz Blau of University of Illinois at Chicago. And please allow me to share some information before closing this webinar. So the next webinar, session four of the GHITS PDP's webinar series will be held in January 2022 with FIND. And the registration page is planning to be opened in December. Please visit our website for more information. There are also several other upcoming webinars in December, which GHIT hosts, co-hosts or sponsors. So please stay tuned. Questionnaire will be sent to you after the webinar. And your answers to the questionnaire really helps us to improve our next webinar series. So we also welcome any ideas for potential partnerships or collaborations. So it would be very helpful if you could take two minutes to fill in the questionnaire. Thank you so much in advance. And thank you for taking your time and joining us today from multiple regions. And we are looking forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, yeah. uh, Kaneko Sensei, Professor Scott, and uh, yeah. Tanaka-san. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>